questions come to us <clears throat> that young people have about sex and things, all different kinds of things, and, and tonight I've got quite a number of questions that have come in, and, and I'd like to kind of deal with them for a few moments together. Let's ask the Lord, as he's told us to do, in Matthew 7, 7, he says, ask, and it shall be given unto you, and let's believe the Lord, because the the Lord said that whatsoever we ask for believing, we shall receive. And then let's reach right out and thank the Lord for the wisdom that he's promised that he'll give us as we deal with some of these questions. Dear Father in heaven, you've promised in James 1.5 to give us wisdom. We have real problems. These young people have real problems. Lord, forgive us older ones for sometimes belittling the problems of young people. Lord, you never belittle our problems, but you've promised to give us big solutions. We thank you for the wisdom you're giving us now because you have promised it to us. Through Jesus Christ, we praise you. Amen. The first question that has come in is, um, I don't know who it's from, whether it's a fellow or a girl, but it says, uh, what promise can I claim to get a certain person for a special friend? I mean a really special friend. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, well, anybody here know a specific promise that a person might be able to claim for a, for a, a special friend? Any of you young people know, we've been talking about promises now, this week. Any special promise you can think of, like that one? Back there. Philippians 4, 19. Let's take a look and see what that says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Let's see, I'm going to sail that over there. Thank you. Philippians 4, verse 19. Okay. And my God shall, apply, shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. How about that? My God will supply all your need. Sounds like you need a friend, special friend. Philippians 4.19. How about claiming that promise for a special friend? You know, the Lord, uh, the Lord knows who that friend is. I praise the Lord that young people are, are wanting to know how to get help from God to pick their friends. I think if there's any one subject that we find young people having problems with today more than anything else, it's this area of boyfriend-girlfriend relationships. I talk to more miserably disturbed young people because of fella-girl relationships than any other area. And one of the primary reasons that I believe we have these problems is because we haven't asked God to direct us in our relationships, all kinds of friendships with each other.
and we've tried to form friendships ourselves. If you claim Philippians 4.19, that God will supply your need of a friend. Now, I don't know. I don't know what your need is. You may think it's a, a certain person, and maybe it kind of sounds like, uh, well, it sounds like from your question that you're asking about a certain person. If a certain person could be your special friend, what promise can I claim to get a certain person for a special friend? Well, there isn't in that promise anything that says, I promise to supply your need of that special person, Charlie. You know, the promise doesn't specify that you're going to get Charlie as your special friend. So when you add to God's promises, when you say, Lord, I, I, I want a special friend and I want it to be Charlie, you have to commit that part to God. Lord, if it's according to your will and if Charlie is the one for me, then, Lord, as I trust you, I know you'll supply my need with Charlie. But, Lord, if he's the wrong one, I don't want him. Right? You know, it reminds me, some, sometimes um, we get a question. I remember a girl came one time to Pastor Coon, and she asked him, What can I do? What promise can I claim to keep my boyfriend? <laughs> and Elder Coon said, There isn't any promise that says you can keep your boyfriend. But God's promised that he'll supply all your need. Oh, but I just can't lose him. I just can't lose him. I couldn't stand it if I'd ever lose him. I've just got to keep him. What could I do? i just got to keep him. Can I claim a promise? No, there isn't any special promise that you can claim that you'll keep him, he said. But, sister, God knows if that's the boy you need to keep. If you'll just trust the Lord and thank him that he's supplying your need, and he's the right one, and if he's trusting the Lord, and you're trusting the Lord, and you're the right ones for each other, as you trust the Lord, why, there's no way that you can ever be separated. If you're really right for each other, and you're both trusting the Lord, trust the Lord. Yeah, but I just don't think I could stand it if I didn't have him. <laughs> and then Elder Coon said something I've never forgotten. He said, listen, young lady, there's something you need to know about fellas. They're kind of like a bus. If you miss one, there'll be another one along in about 20 minutes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So don't, and fellas, it's the same way. If you miss one, there'll be another gal along in about 15 minutes. You, <laughs> 10, maybe. You know? Did you know that? There's lots more girls around than there are fellas. Some of you girls will realize that. But as we trust God, he knows what our needs are. Claim that promise. And don't try to rush the Lord. You know, uh, about a week ago, we were holding a series of meetings, and a young girl came up to me that I had met at one of our academies a couple years ago. And she told me about having talked to me at that time, and I, I did remember talking to her. And she said, you remember when I talked to you a couple years ago, I, was, I told you that I was chasing boys. And, and I was just always chasing them, and I had this terrible habit of chasing boys. I was just chasing them all the time, and I could never seem to find a special one. And I said, yeah, I can't remember talking to you. We stood on the porch at your school, didn't we? She said, yeah, that's right. I said, what did I tell you to do? She said, you said that I should claim a promise that God would supply my needs and quit chasing them. And you told me that probably the reason I hadn't caught one was because I was chasing them, and that if I'd quit chasing them and trust the Lord, that the Lord would take care of my friends. And she said, you know, that's right. I've, I've found friends that I never had before, and I now have a very special friend because I've trusted the Lord for it. I don't have to chase anybody. God's promised to supply all my needs. That kind of has to do with this next question. Brother Steve, I've got an inferiority complex, and I don't know what to do about it. It costs me friends. I'm so shy, I just don't feel like I'm worth anything. What can I do? Bless your heart. You know, there's so many people that have got that problem, an inferiority complex. I used to have an inferiority complex, too. Uh, I didn't express mine in the same way you express yours, by being shy. I tried to hide behind my inferiority complex by being big and loud and, oh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. There's two ways that inferiority complexes, at least two ways, exhibit themselves. One is by people hiding and trying to go in and be shy and hide behind, you know, this quiet little mousy, meek kind of an attitude. And there's the other kind that people build up a big wall, a big front, a big mm, thing, and they try to hide behind that. That's the way I was. 
But you know what cured my inferiority complex and what I've seen cure the inferiority complex of other people? And that is realizing really who you are and what value you are to God. See, God created you to be a particular individual. You are one of a kind. You say, yeah, that's the trouble. <laughs> no, that's not the trouble. That's the beauty of it all. You know, I like to think of God as, as thinking of each one of us as a different kind of an instrument. Think of musical instruments for a moment. Think of a huge, gigantic symphony and a master conductor picking the, the instruments to be in this symphonic uh, uh, concert, right? And he picks out every different kind of instrument. He picks out great, huge bass drums. Boom, 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 boom. He picks out timpani. He picks out snare drums. He picks out trumpets. He picks out a slide trombone. Right? He picks out clarinets. Wasn't a very good clarinet. He picks out harps. You know? He picks out guitars. He picks out flutes. Fife. You know, he picks out bassoons. Picks out bass horns. Every different kind of instrument you can imagine. And all of those instruments are vital to the total sound of the symphony. And every single one of them has a different tone. No two trumpets have the same tone. No two drums have the same tone. No two saxophones, no two anything have the same tone. And those variations in tone are what create the excitement and the, the beautiful mingling of sound. Well, when it struck me that that's what God is doing, and that's what God has in mind with his creation as far as human beings are concerned. God has in mind human beings making up a giant, incredible symphony. And each individual that God has created, including you, are one of a kind. And God values you so very much that he died that he might save your instrument. Most of us haven't got the faintest idea who we are yet. And until we recognize our value to God, we have terrible inferiority complex. But you know what? We don't have to have an inferiority complex anymore because God loves us. We belong to the creator, the king of the whole universe. Now, I guarantee you that if you were born to a, a king or a queen, of some country in this world, you know, you would be, if you're a girl, you'd be a princess. Hey, I'm a princess. I belong. I'm a princess. If you were a young man, you'd be a prince. I'm a prince. You'd have something. Well, I want you to know this, that brothers and sisters, as you accepted Jesus as your personal savior, you have become a prince. You've become a princess. You are the child of the king. You're more valuable than any humanly, worldly prince or princess. More valuable. And, and the riches that God has for you throughout eternity will make the greatest, richest kingdom on earth look like peanuts. <laughs> we have no right as we understand that God loves us and died for us and has given us his life. We have no right to feel inferior anymore. I still don't know really who I am. I still know that God is not finished with me. Oh, there's so much in myself that I don't like. Sometimes I'm so loud when I'd like to be quiet. Sometimes I'm so quick and sharp and, you know, when I'd like to be mellow and loving. But God's working to change that. Don't look at your faults. Look at the value that God has placed upon you. And then say, God, I thank you for who I am. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that 
though I don't really know what I'm going to end up to be, that when you appear, I shall be like you. And throughout eternity, my individuality will continue to increase and grow and grow, and I'll become more and more of a beautiful instrument, a different beautiful instrument for you. You know, but one of the devil's primary lies that he tells to young people when they come to Christ, or old people as far as that's concerned, is that if you accept Christianity, you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're going to be put in a mold and you're all going to be alike. That is not so. That's a lie. The only way that you can ever experience who you really are as an individual is by accepting God's love and letting him guide your life and direct your life and show you who you are. And you know the funny thing as you do that, as you follow God, you find that the things that you used to strive to get for yourself, you no longer value those things anymore, but you get them. For instance, just to give you an example. I, I used to, when I was an actor, I used to do everything on, I could think of to get people to look at me, to love me. Okay? The, and and I, my whole life was, was based on trying to get people to look at me, love me. And when they did, it didn't do anything for me because I wasn't really giving them anything. All I was giving them was a, a show. But then when I found Jesus, and I fell in love with Jesus, and I found that the greatest joy in the world is pointing people to Jesus, I found that people were drawn to Jesus in me, that I began to experience love from people that I'd always wanted, but it wasn't love for myself, it was love for Jesus through me. And now, when people come up to me and they pat me on the back and they say, oh, Steve, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, it kind of makes me sick inside. Because I used to want them to think that. Now I don't want people to think I'm wonderful. I want them to know that it's Jesus that's wonderful, that he's the one that's changed me. I don't want that old thing anymore. I just want to be the beautiful instrument God's created me to be, to share his love. I was praying with a, a group of uh, people not too long ago. We were around in a circle praying. And as the people prayed around the circle, there was one brother that began to pray. He was, he was English. And as he began to pray, he had a different kind of personality than, than anybody I'd ever heard before. I didn't know him, but in his prayer, a personality came out. And as he was praying, I realized like that, hey, this beautiful person here and, and the, the personality that he's expressing right now is part of Jesus' personality. That God has created every one of us to show a different part of his total personality. When you see a person that's got a sense of humor, realize that if that sense of humor is directed right towards right and pure kinds of things, know that that's part of God's sense of humor. A lot of people think God hasn't got any sense of humor. That's ridiculous. He created me. He, he must have a sense of humor. And, and after all, isn't it the Lord that, that sends the ducks back north in the springtime? And sometimes the Lord has a little surprise waiting for them. The pond hasn't thawed yet. The lake hasn't thawed, and those ducks have flown all the way from the south, you know. Here they've come, you know. Here they've come, uh, going home, going home. Oh, there's home. There's the lake. Oh, we're going to land on that wonderful lake, scooch down into that home water. Here we go. Come on, gang. And they go to land in that water, but the Lord has a little surprise for them. And they land on the lake and they begin to spin around. Have you ever seen pictures of ducks landing too soon on the lake? <laughs> Feathers flying in every direction, spinning around. Don't you think the Lord's up there saying, wow, wasn't that fun? <laughs> you bet. Now, some people think that's sacrilegious to think of God in that way. Some people think that, that God is up there looking down his nose at people saying, listen here, you so-and-so, you shape up or I'm going to fry you. And I'm a very serious and a very serious and sober person. Oh, my. What a horrid picture of God. That isn't God at all. You know how God really looks down to us on this earth? He looks down and he says, oh, look. What's your name? Tim. He says, Tim, before you know him, Tim, he's, he's drawing you. He's saying, Tim, Tim, 
I love you. Tim, I've got a better way of life for you. Tim, listen to my voice. Look at my son. I, I love you, Tim. Tim, that's it. That's it. Look up from that muck and mire that you're in. Look up. That's right. Oh, Tim, you're seeing my son. You're accepting Jesus. That's it. Oh, Tim, yes. You're now my son. Oh, I love you, Tim. I love you. Now, Tim, as you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, and as you're walking the life, follow Jesus. Keep your eyes on my son. Keep claiming the promises. And, and just walk along. Trust me. You're doing fine. That's it. You're, you're just a little baby Christian. You're crawling now, but you're doing right well. That's it. Doing well. Now, Tim, just ahead of you now, Tim, there's a, the devil has dug a pit. It's a big temptation of a pit. So when you get close there, you just follow Jesus. Follow a straight line right by that pit. Don't pay any attention. You'll hear a voice coming out of the pit saying, Tim, come over here. Don't pay attention to him. You just keep following Jesus. That'll boy, Tim. Tim, you're coming close to the pit now. It's just right up beyond that bush there. That's it. Keep coming. Now, Tim, you hear the voice now? Oh, Tim, you hear the voice. Don't listen to it. Keep looking to you. Tim, Tim, don't listen to that voice. Tim, don't, don't crawl toward the pit. No, Tim, no, no, no. Tim, listen, come back, come on. Don't, you're just going to hurt you. Tim, no, no, no. Tim, Tim, Tim. <laughs> Tim. Oh, Tim. Tim, you fell in the pit. <laughs> yeah, I know he's in there with you, and he's telling you that you can't get out, but he's a liar. Come on, Tim. Take my hand. Come on. Look up. No, I'm not mad at you. Yes, you can. Come on, accept my love. Come on, that's it. That's it. Oh, good, he's looking. Look, he's looking. Come on. <laughs> uh, oh, good, Tim. And the Lord puts you on the right side of the pit. He puts you closer to heaven. Come on, Tim. That a boy. Now look, Tim's walking. He's walking like a little fella in the, in the Lord. Walking along. That's it. Now, Tim, just around the bend of the road up here. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. If you take your eyes off Jesus, you have to step in that snare that the devil set ahead. It's one of those rope tricks, snares, you know, with a rope in the trail covered with the leaves, with a rope up in the tree, you know. Don't step in that. Watch. Follow step by step in Jesus. Keep claiming his promise. That's it, Tim. It's just around the corner there. That's it. Now, step right around. Step. Tim, don't go toward the snare. Tim, no. Tim, please. Tim, oh, Tim. Tim, you're hanging upside down by your foot now, Tim. And the devil's telling you you can't get loose. He's a liar. I'll cut you down, Tim. That's God. Brothers and sisters, that's God. He values you so much. He's a loving God. He, brother, he is. He loves you with all your heart. Sister, he loves you. Let's not let the devil give us inferiority complexes and make him think that God hates us and is trying to make us into something that we don't want to be. God wants to make us into that thing that our insides are longing to be. Happy, free, joyous, loving people. Wow, I got carried away on that one. But praise the Lord. Here's another one. I think sex is fantastic. And I don't see anything wrong with it. Why isn't it okay if both persons agree on it? Is it adultery since we're not married? Oh, two questions here. Okay. I think sex is fantastic and I don't see anything wrong with it. Why isn't it okay if both persons agree on it? And is it adultery since we're not married? No, it's not adultery. The Bible calls sex outside of a marriage relationship to single individuals. That's called fornication. It's called the sin of fornication. And, uh, and uh, you don't see it. Why isn't it okay if both of you agree on it? Well, huh. the reason it isn't okay is because God didn't create you to have that kind of illicit relationships outside of the marriage relationships. Uh, and he says that fornication, the end of fornication is death and destruction. In fact, the book of Revelation, page chapter 21, verse 8, says that, that outside the gates of the city of God are fornicators and adulterers and murderers and sorcerers and so forth. It excludes people that engage in these things. Why? Because they are really involved in a, in a selfish worship. It's a trap. It can become an addiction. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with sex outside of marriage? Well, God created us to be total beings. And God created sex to be a part of a relationship as an adult married person. There are different parts to the marriage relationship. 
Marriage means a joining together of two to become one, a total joining together. God intends for us to be joined together emotionally, together, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Four parts totally joined together. But when we engage in only one part of that relationship, just the physical, we're robbing ourselves of the blessing that is in the other three and the totality of it. We're cheating ourselves and we're cheating each other. We're actually hurting ourselves and hurting each other. It's like a car. If you run a car on uh, two cylinders and it's a six-cylinder car, you're going to burn out the two cylinders that you're running it on. You're going to wreck them. God did not create us to function that way, only in one area. He wants in marriage for us to be joined totally together, to be one complete being, to depend upon each other for our, and God, three, right? The three in one. He wants us to, to, to lean upon himself and each other and give and take with each other in our emotional areas, in our intellectual needs, in our physical needs, and in our spiritual needs. And therefore, we become whole beings. You know, I, I realize that this is a problem today. It was a problem when I was in, you know, my teens too. I'll never forget, though, but a story that I heard not too long ago about a, about a fellow that, that went into a park. And uh, he had some time to kill. He was going to meet some friends there. And they hadn't arrived yet, and so this park had a beautiful garden in one section of it, beautiful rose garden. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rose bushes, rows and rows of rose bushes. And it was just that time of the year when the rose bushes are coming into bud, and they, they're just, the buds are just getting nice and large. They aren't quite in bloom yet, and he never really paid much attention to flowers. You know, I mean, after all, I was just a fella, right? But he thought, I got nothing else to do, so I might as well wander around through this place. So he began to walk down the, the rows of roses, and, and they began to intrigue him, these incredible bushes with their beautiful, waxy, fresh green leaves with, you know, the little tinges of red on them as those roses begin to come out, you know, and those new leaves come. And as he was looking at them, he stopped, and he looked at one bush, and he saw a little sign there and said, certain kind of red rose. And he looked at the buds on that, on that uh, bush, and my, they were beautifully formed. And then he saw up near the top one bud that was especially large, especially perfectly formed. It was bigger than all the rest of it. It looked like, like it was going to be the, the crowning rose of the whole bush. And he thought, boy, I wonder what, what color these roses are going to be. That one is going to really be something when it comes out. Oh, I, I wonder what color it will be. I, I, I sure would like to see what, what color that's going to be. And so he reached out, and he took hold of that bud, and he just ever so carefully just bent the stalk toward him, and then he just held it so, so carefully in his hand, and then very gently he just pulled back the little green part, you know, that comes up around the petals, just pulled one back, and then very carefully just pulled back the second one, and just loosened that bud around like this, then just very carefully pulled it back so that he could look down inside some of those petals. He just oh so carefully touched back that path. Oh, look at that red. Oh, they're going to be beautiful. Oh, I can hard. I'm going to come back in about two weeks or a week and see what this bud looks like. And he oh so carefully put it back together again. Just formed it together, put the little green parts back up again, and put it together. And he said, okay, now let me see. It's one, two, three rose bushes from the end. I'm going to come here right up there. I'm going to come see that one. That's going to be my special rose. I can hardly wait to see what that's going to be like. And he walked on down the road, and he, and he came to a, a yellow rose bush, and the, the buds were just about to burst open. And again, he found one special yellow bud that was more beautiful than any of the others. Oh, he said, this one I know is going to be so beautiful. I wonder if it's kind of a goldy yellow, or if it's a yellow yellow, a sharp yellow. Oh, I... I just want to see. And so he did again the same thing with this rosebud. And he opened it and looked at, oh, it's going to, oh, man, is that going to be good. And he put it then to, ever so carefully together. Can I see where, ah, oh, that's right. Now that's going to be my yellow 
grows. My very own, I'm going to come back and see that. And he went down the road and he found a white bush. And again, there was one bud on that white bush. And he did the same with it. He, he examined it just ever so carefully. He opened it and then put it back and said, I'm going to come back and see this. Oh, he could hardly wait. The days just seemed to drag by every time he thinked about those roses. And finally, in about a week and a half, he had an opportunity to go back, and he knew it was just about time when they'd be in full bloom. He came back, and he eagerly walked down that row of roses. Down he came, one, two, three, and there was that bush in bloom. Oh, the blooms on that bush. And he looked. Let me see now. Where my bud? There. Oh. There, that bud that had been the most promising, the most beautiful, that he knew was just going to be the largest one on the whole bush. There it was. Only it was deformed now. It hadn't opened like the Creator had intended for it to. Its little petals were brown, tinged on the edges. It was twisted. It opened kind of halfway on one side, and the other side was withered. The little tender green parts that held it together were drying, curled down underneath it. Oh, no. I do that? Well, well, maybe that yellow one, the yellow one, it's going to really be something. And he walked down and he found the yellow bush, and there that yellow bud, all brown, all wilted, all deformed. Oh, no. Oh, no, I ruined that. And he went to the white bush and the same there. And a little tear welled up in that big, tough teenager's eye and streamed down his face because he realized that he lost, because of his own actions, he lost the very thing that he wanted. He never got to see that beautiful flower. He never got to experience its perfect, fragrant aroma because he ruined it. And fellas, these girls are God's flowers. They're buds. And God created them and values them inestimably more than he values a flower. And when you or I take that bud and tamper with it, before it's time. We deform it. We mutilate it. And we can never make up what we've done to it. And gals, the fellows are God's flowers too. And when you, by your actions, by your words, by your teasing, draw them into lustful thoughts and actions, you also are destroying something that is precious, precious to God. And in this earth can never be made up again. That's why God doesn't want us involved in those wrong kinds of relationships. He wants us to join in a beautiful relationship the way he intended them. That's why it's worth waiting. Now, if some of you fellas, some of you girls, right now recognize yourself to be one of those <coughs> mutilated buds, don't let Satan condemn you God doesn't. He loves you. He forgives you. If you'll just take his forgiveness. And he's promised that he'll recreate you. You'll carry a scar with you the rest of your life in this earth. And it'll hurt you from time to time. But you can be assured that God loves you and he hasn't given you up. The gardener hasn't snipped you off and thrown you into the trash pile. And he's promised that he'll restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. 
accept his forgiveness, accept his love, and go on from here and let him purify your life with his power. And he will. I hope that answers your question. It answered mine. Because I had the same basic kind of question, too, when I came to the Lord. You know, how, what should you do with a guy-girl relationship? What's the Bible say about it? And God doesn't make rules to be arbitrary rules. There's principles behind them. Well, here's one that's kind of along the same line. How far can a Christian guy and a girl go if they really love each other? We're planning on getting married after we get out of school. Well, good. Praise the Lord. You're planning on getting married after you get out of school. How far can you go? Well, brothers and sisters, I think the best way to know how far you ought to go is to realize that you're Christians, and Jesus has said in Matthew 28, 20, that, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In your relationship, don't do anything to or with each other that you would do if you could see Jesus Christ right there with his arms around each of you. We need to learn to practice the presence of Jesus. He is with us. His presence is marvelous in keeping us in right relationships, in right attitudes. Uh, how many times have you been speeding just a little bit over the speed limit, driving down the road, and out of the corner of your eye, you see a black and white. Okay? You see the highway patrol. And your foot goes, mm -hmm. you know? The presence of the man has a calming effect <laughs> on my behavior. So the presence of the man God, Jesus Christ, dwelling with you, will have a calming effect on your passions. If you want to know how to have a beautiful relationship, fellas and gals, those of you that are into a real one-to-one -one relationship, bring Jesus into the middle of that relationship. Spend your precious time together instead of working each, up, each other up into a lather of, you know, caresses and, pa and, and, and petting. Spend your time doing something together for somebody else. Spend your time getting in God's Word together and discovering the joy that is there in the Word, and we're going to share with you how you can really get into the Word and enjoy it. Spend time on your knees together. If, if you really have got a boyfriend or girlfriend that, and you're planning on getting married and you're at the age where you really think that you've made the decision on who it should be and you've you know, you've had associations with enough, enough other young people and you feel like God is leading you into marriage, then start your dating relationship now with God in the middle of it and, and a prayer relationship with each other. And continue that then in your marriage. Never once in the five years that we've been counseling and sharing God's love with people have we met one couple who's splitting up and getting a divorce that has spent time praying and studying the Word of God together. Not once have we ever found one couple that are going to get a divorce and they say, yes, we've spent time together praying with each other. We've spent time together in God's Word together. When those things fall out of the marriage, the marriage falls apart. So form it in your relationships with fellows and girls right now where you are. And I'd like to just give a word of counsel. I, w I went steady with the girl from the time I was um, 16. She was 13. Brother, I would never, never suggest anybody do that. Because we were, neither one of us were adults. We were both really young in our emotions. Oh, yeah, we knew a lot of things, but we didn't know what, who we were, let alone how, who the other person was. And we got all carried away with each other and got all emotionally involved, and 
we'd break up and just heartache and old crying and tears and the whole thing and fights and then we get together again and back and forth. It was horrible, horrible. And I saw my other friends that had many girlfriends, many girls that they'd take, you know, to the Saturday night program or go to MV with or, or they'd spend time with a lot of fellows. Man, they weren't having the hassles I was having. I finally ended up marrying that girl. And I really loved her. But it never worked because we never gave each other a chance to find out who we were by experiencing other people. You know? Some of you won't do it. You won't pay any attention. The <laughs> proverb says, blessed is he who takes counsel. So God bless you as you take the blessing. Get to know lots of people. You might find, chances are, the person you think is most attractive today if you'll look around, six months from now, you'll wonder, what in the world did I really see in that person? We didn't really have anything in common. He had a nice nose. She had a neat dimple, you know. Try that. You'll be blessed. Um, that's a promise, by the way, you can claim. Christ's presence with you when you're together. When you start out your date, say, hey, we're taking Jesus with us. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Thank you for helping us to, to remember that you're with us. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to get home at curfew, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and not upset mother. That's the way Christians are, too, you know? I've been a Christian for about six months. My boyfriend isn't yet, and he's really giving me a rough time. I don't want to do the things we used to do together. I mean parties and sex and stuff. I've given in to him a few times, and I really feel awful about it. But when I refuse, he gets really obnoxious. What should I do? I really love him. Bless your heart. See, love gives. And your boyfriend doesn't love you. He may say he loves you, but when he knows what your desire is, that you have a, want a new life and you want to change, and still he... He entices you, and then when you won't go along with him, he's obnoxious to you. That proves that he doesn't love you. He's trying to force you. He's trying to pressure you into getting his way, the big baby. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with love at all. That is total selfishness. You know? That's, I see this happening all the time. Young people saying, oh, we've got this, I just love him and he loves me, you know? And then... Then all these fights and all these squabbles and all well, you won't do it, and well, well, I don't want you. That's not love. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love is sensitive to the other one's needs. And don't let him pressure you and tell you, I need it, I need it, I need it. I need sex. God's promised to supply all your needs. And you don't need all the sex you think you need, my friend. If you're a fellow, the Lord's given you a way of dealing with that naturally. And I'm not talking about masturbation either. God knows what your needs are. And if you trust him, he'll satisfy those needs. Doesn't mean you won't be tempted and won't be hassled. But it means that you can claim his victory and his peace. You can only look in one direction at a time. And if you're looking at the lust that's in your heart, that's where you'll go. If you're dwelling on the passion, you'll become more impassioned. The way to overcome your lustful passion is to get a greater passion, and that's a passion for the true love, the love of Christ, the love of sharing with other people. And God will take care of your sex life. He will. I know. He really will. I'd like to pray for this young lady that God will give her the strength, the promise that you can claim you ask for help. The promise you can claim is Philippians 4, 13. It says, I have strength for everything through Christ which strengtheneth me. Strength to say no to that boyfriend. And if God sees it's necessary and that boyfriend isn't being drawn to Christ at all and he doesn't have any interest at all, God will even give you strength to break off that relationship. You see, God wants for you the best relationship. And it may not look that way. Oh, I don't know, I couldn't stand it if I didn't have him. But the relationship is hurting you now. 
See, God never asks you to give up something that's good for you or that will make you really happy. He wants to give you something in its place. I hear people talking about, I accept the Lord, and I gave up this, and I gave up that, and I gave up the other thing, and poor me. They, have ne they don't understand who Christ is at all. When you accept Christ and trust Christ and go to Christ for all your needs, you don't give up anything. You receive everything, and Christ crowds out of your life all those empty, ugly things that held you captive that really made you miserable, those selfish things. All of you that know that and have recognized that in your life, will you raise your hand? Look at that. Praise the Lord. Young people recognize it's true. Praise God. That's right. So as you claim Philippians 4.13, Lord, I need strength to know what to do in this situation. I need wisdom to what to do. I believe that you'll keep me strong, that I won't let down the standards that you've put in my heart of right. Thank you for working in me that right. And Lord, if he's not going to come to you, then Lord, show me how to break this relationship off. Thank you for saving him, Lord, some way. But thank you that I don't have to go through this misery and you've got somebody that's a Christian for me at the right time. And God will do it. I'd like to pray for everybody right now that's having a problem with a boyfriend or a girlfriend that God will give you strength to do what his Holy Spirit draws you in love to do the right. Dear Lord, Thank you for this promise. Thank you for these brothers and sisters that want, to, want your power completely in their lives. They don't want to do all those old things that they know have not given them any peace. They want to follow you. Lord, you've created us for fellowship with each other, and you've promised to supply all of our needs, including our sexual needs. Lord, we want to claim that strength right now, and we do. We thank you that you are giving us the strength to know what to do in our relationships with each other. Thank you that you are with us, guiding us, and directing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why do you think... Uh, oh, I think I had one more here someplace about sex. Oh, yeah. I heard there isn't going to be a any marriage in heaven. Is that so? If it is, I don't want to go because <laughs> I want to be married and have a family. I don't know how many times we've gotten this question in the, as we've traveled around with young people. Don't want to go to heaven because you don't want to miss out on all the, the fun of marriage and children. You know what you're really saying, I suspect? I think you're saying if there isn't any marriage in heaven, that means there isn't going to be a sex in heaven. And if there isn't any sex in heaven, I don't think I'll enjoy it, so I don't want to go. <laughs> a lot of young people come up and say, I hope the Lord doesn't come too soon because I want to get married first and have a family. <laughs> They're really saying, I hope the Lord doesn't come because I haven't had enough sex and I want to have sex. <laughs> you know, aren't we silly? The, the pleasures that we have experienced here, we think that that's the ultimate pleasure. I want to share something with you that blew my mind as I... As, as the Lord showed it to me. It, God, has, God is the creator of sex. He's the one that thought it up. Sex is not dirty. It is beautiful. The sensual experience of sex, the um, whole emotional and physical reaction that happens is the invention of God. The pleasure was his idea. Satan did not create pleasure. God created pleasure. Satan just twisted us so that we don't understand how to experience the greatest pleasure, and we settle for less than the greatest pleasure. And God created sex as a sensual part of a marriage relationship that welds two individuals totally cohesively together. He gave sex as a symbol, follow me, he gave sex as a symbol of something that he has in store for us in our relationship with him because he likens the relationship with him to marriage. Christ is the bride. The church is the bride. Christ is the, Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride, right? And and God has said, I in you and you in me. That is a total relationship. And I believe with all my heart that sex in a human relationship, marriage relationship, 
is to help us understand something of the ecstasy, the thrilling, pleasurable experience when finally we are totally united in marriage with God to dwell with him throughout eternity. Is there no sex in heaven? Is there no marriage in heaven? Heaven is a marriage. It is the marriage of the huma human being to his creator, God. And marriage here is just a shadow of the marriage that's to come. And all the beautiful things in marriage here is merely, is merely a, a taste of the beautiful things in their relationship in the kingdom. I'm not saying now that eternity is going to be one eternal sexual climax. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that whatever sex is here will be so far superseded by the real thing in our relationship with God that we will forget how pleasurable we thought it was here because the pleasure is so much beyond it in heaven. Well, will we have one-to-one -one relationships like we do now, husband and wife? No. Jesus said we'd be like angels. Well, angels are sexless. How do you know what angels are like? <laughs> what kind of pleasures they're capable of experiencing? What kind of fellowship they have with God and with one another? Whatever it is, it far supersedes what we have. And God's promised that we will be above the angels in the kingdom. So don't worry about that. You know, I've determined in my life, I used to be, I used to be a very sexually oriented person, almost totally motivated sexually. Or I thought that was what was motivating me, right? I was motivated trying to find peace. And I tried to find it through all kinds of sensual relationships. But when I found Jesus, I realized who he was, that he wanted to give me peace, and he was giving me that peace, and that he'd take care of my sexual needs. And you know, brothers and sisters, I'm single, and I'm not looking for a mate. I have found something in Jesus Christ that is so beautiful, and God has given me a mission in life. It's not that I'm against marriage. I'm not against marriage at all. But God has given me a passion for winning souls to Jesus Christ. And right now, I don't know what God has in the future for me, but right now, the way I feel, all I want to do is get this mess over with so we can all go home and be married to the Lord. Okay? And I've told the Lord, I said, Lord, if I never experience a love relationship, a marriage relationship, a sex relationship, in the human form, it's worth it because of the peace you give me now and the eternal joy I'm going to have with you. You don't have to worry about it. God will take care of your needs. I have to admit that I must claim God's promise and victory over lust every single day of my life. I'm hassled and tempted thousands of times during the day, sometimes, literally, thousands of times. Those thoughts, ding, ding, ding. And I go to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. Redirect me, Lord. Thank you. My eyes wander. Thank you, Lord. Claiming his promise to bring me back, and he's changing me. He can satisfy all of your needs the same way. Claim his promise, and my God will supply all your needs out of the abundance of riches in Christ Jesus. And don't worry about marriage in heaven. It's going to be so far beyond what this is you can't imagine. Well, let me see. One more. What can I do? about loneliness. You know, there are times in the human experience when we are humanly lonely. And if you don't have a husband or wife, and if you're, if you're a teenager and you don't have a, someone to go to, you can't go to your folks because they won't listen to you, and you're lonely to talk to somebody, and you haven't got a real good friend you can talk to, you know, God wants to communicate to you one-to-one. -one. He wants... He wants to give you peace. Uh, my partner, David, was uh, here in the United States while the team went over to the Far East a couple of years ago. He was taking care of some business we had here, and we were over there for about three months. And usually, we all traveled together 
At that time, there were about six of us that were traveling together all the time. We had a lot of fellowship together and, and uh, sharing together and witnessing together and eating together and so forth. And so we have a beautiful relationship in sharing Jesus together. And there isn't a, a great deal of time to be lonely. But now the whole team was gone over in the Far East, and Dave was all by himself. He was living in, a, in our bus uh, and uh, spending all this time by himself writing letters and taking care of some business. And I remember he wrote me a letter while I was over in uh, Japan, I think. And the letter came, and he said, you know, I was laying in, in bed last night, and he said, I began to feel lonely. I was lonely because I, I wanted someone, a mate, you know? I just felt like I just wished I had a mate. I didn't have anybody to talk to. The team's gone. And I just was really experiencing loneliness. I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. And he said, as I was laying there, all of a sudden, it was like just as clear as anything in my mind, a thought voice kind of like thing. The Lord said to him, David, I'm right here, and I've got my arms right around you. What more could you want? And he said, as I thought about that, that, that my Jesus was right there with me. He said, you know, that loneliness just, just went away and left me, and I had perfect peace. Jesus will give you that peace. He will. Don't get into self, um, self-pity. Don't get into dwelling on these negative things. Oh, me, poor me, I'm poor me. If you do that, the Lord might have somebody for you. But here you are moping around, oh, poor me, you know, I'm just so, I don't know me. And who in the world would want you? Rejoice in the Lord. Be glad. Thank him that he's supplying your needs. Re and you know what? People will be drawn to you. And maybe that someone special will be drawn to you. Sex and things. And Jesus will take care of them all. Did you come in with a burden? Some kind of a burden? Burden of self, selfishness, passion, lust? Jesus will take the burden. You can roll it on him, and you can take his promise. Let's pray. We thank you tonight, Lord, that you've given us principles of your love. You have created us to enjoy, to be at peace, to experience pleasure. And Lord, without you in the pleasure, the pleasure is hollow and empty. Thank you that you died for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed right where you are, maybe you're one of those lonely people. You haven't experienced Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've been trying to fill your life with relationships with people, with sex and things. But you realize that what you need is God. And tonight you'd like to say, Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as my Savior. Right now, this moment, I receive you. Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you thank him for being your Savior now, for forgiving all your sins, and for supplying all your needs? You may thank him. As we pray this prayer together, dear Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for supplying all my needs. I give you my burdens. I give you myself. I accept you. And I thank you for living in me and giving me your perfect peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Roll, roll your burdens away. Roll, roll your burdens away, for Jesus has promised.